In Kisuke Urahara's lab, things are pretty tense. Captain Jushiro Ukitake from the 13th Division steps up, ready to take the Soul King's place. Urahara's in shock, wondering if that's even possible, but Ukitake just says he'll explain later. This took me by surprise because until now, Ukitake has never really taken an active role in many battles. So he takes off his captain's cloak, steps onto the platform, and lifts his shihakusho, revealing a creepy eye-shaped symbol on his back surrounded by a dark aura. The other captains are totally speechless, but Ukitake's squad mates, Kione and Sentaro, instantly recognize the symbol. His lieutenant, Rukia, watches wide-eyed as Ukitake draws his sword and starts chanting to Mimihagi, a divine spirit he's trusted before. We flash back to a young, sickly Ukitake with his parents pleading with Mimihagi to save him from a deadly sickness. In a tense moment, he drinks a strange liquid from Mimihagi and miraculously survives, gaining the mysterious power that's now swirling around him. Flashing back, we see a younger Ukitake walking through the streets exuding his trademark friendliness. Suddenly, he spots an elderly woman, Oyone, engaged in a heated argument with a towering brute intent on intimidating her. Before the situation escalates, Ukitake swiftly intervenes, grabbing the man's arm in a firm warning. Then to everyone's astonishment, Oyon delivers a stunning uppercut that sends the menacing thug crashing to the ground. Ukitake beams with pride, helping the downed man to his feet, and playfully suggests that if he loves a good fight so much, he should think about enrolling in the Shinigami Academy. Just as he's laughing it off, Ukitake suddenly coughs up blood into his hand, a tough reminder of his ongoing battle with illness. Right now, Captain Commander Shunsui Kyoraku is standing by the door of the Mukin as it opens and tells Ukitake to relax. We then see a flashback to their younger days at the Shino Academy, where Shunsui and Ukitake are in a sparring match, while Unohana Sasakibe and Yamamoto watch them closely. While they are squaring off, Unohana can't help but be impressed by their form, and Yamamoto nods in agreement, admiring their potential. After the sparring match, the duo exchange names, but Ukitake can't help but admit he already knew Shunsui since he'd been sneaking glances in class. Embarrassed, Ukitake then springs a delightful surprise on Shunsui with a big favor to ask. Ukitake is interested in some sweets, and he wants Shunsui to take him to his favorite sweet shop. Turns out, the sweets aren't just for him, they are for his younger siblings too. Over the years, Shunsui and Ukitake have become best buddies. One day, Ukitake takes Shunsui to the Mimihagi Shrine, sharing that it saved him as a child. Lighting a candle, he tells Shunsui that Mimihagi is a deity of his district. Shunsui reveals he's heard rumors of a divine power, separated from the Soul King, represented by Mimihagi's right hand, bringing blessings. Ukitake realizes Shunsui likely heard about Mimihagi because of his illness, but Shunsui assures him it doesn't change anything, he'll never let Ukitake go down easily. Years later, after Kayan Shiba's death, Ukitake stands before Central 46, refusing to appoint a new lieutenant, honoring Kayan's memory. After Yamamoto's shocking death at Yuhabaha's hands, Shunsui, Ukitake, and Unohana meet in the First Division's barracks. Shunsui can't help but grumble about Yamamoto picking such a terrible time to die, leaving him with the huge job of Captain Commander. Ukitake cracks a joke about how they'd usually be sharing drinks in better times, while Unohana playfully asks if any amount of drinking ever helped Shunsui feel better. He admits it did, especially after being rejected, but she assures him he won't need it now. She's here for him. When Shunsui asks for some alone time, Unohana and Ukitake step out. Unohana, showing off her tough Kenpachi side, hints that they'll see each other soon, just as the Wandenreich launches its second invasion. I believe this is the moment Unohana had her deadly battle with Zaraki. At the same time, Sentaro and Kione notice some weird stuff happening in Seirete and rush to warn Ukitake. In the present, Ukitake is focused on a ritual to protect everyone, chanting as a dark aura swirls behind him. As the power builds, he starts coughing up blood, making Rukia worry. He reveals he's letting Mimihagi take over his organs, turning him into the Soul King's right arm. Rukia asks if he's thought this through, and Ukitake nods, ready to sacrifice himself for the Gote 13. Her grief spills out, but he only apologizes for worrying her. He reminds her of his belief in fighting for life or honor, words that echo in Shunsui's mind as he prepares to confront Sosuke Aizen. Meanwhile, Ichigo faces off against Yuhabaha, who dodges and counters effortlessly. Yuhabaha explains that the Soul King was created to keep the world stable, and if he's gone, everything, Soul Society, Waco Mundo, and the human world, will fall apart. Yoruichi and her crew race to revive the Soul King. 
Ganju and Sato charge in with sand clouds and punches, while Yoruichi zaps with lightning. But Yuhabaha stops them all, and Orihime's healing doesn't work as the Soul King's form flickers, only to shatter once more. Yoruichi and Sato get blasted by Yuhabaha's fiery reishi flames. He laughs, saying no human can save the Soul King. But as Yuhabaha keeps insisting that the Soul King is doomed, Sato notices the red crystal around him starting to fade, and Ganju feels hope slipping away. Then, out of nowhere, dark energy bursts from Ukitake's eyes and mouth, wrapping around him. Mimihagi's aura shoots up into the sky, stretching a hand through a hole in the barrier. Everyone watches in shock as this dark figure starts to cover the Soul King, even opening an eye on its palm. Yuhabaha is stunned, realizing he can't predict what Mimihagi will do next. Meanwhile, in the lab, Rukia, Sentaro, and Kione watch in horror as Ukitake twitches. Sufang asks how long he can keep this up, while Urahara admits he's not sure how much longer Ukitake can hold on. Urahara quickly rallies the team, telling Rukia, Renji, Byakuya, and the others to hurry and save the world. Just then, Yushiro says the Tenchi Haiso is ready, but Urahara realizes they don't have enough Reiatsu to pull it off. Elsewhere, Shunsui stands in Mukin in front of Aizen's restraints. With permission to unlock only three keys, he frees Aizen's mouth so he can finally speak after years of silence. As Shunsui wonders how anyone could still talk after such a long time, Aizen surprises him, stepping forward and calmly responding. Although Aizen appeared in the first part of the Thousand Year Blood War, his presence here is quite frightening. Shunsui can't believe Aizen's already breaking free with just his mouth unsealed. Aizen stands there, looking cool in his tattered restraints, and asks if Shunsui plans to use the last two keys. Quick as a flash, Shunsui sticks two more keys into Aizen's eye and ankle, teasing him about how it feels to finally use those. Aizen smirked and said Shunsui hadn't changed much, which made Shunsui unsure if that was a compliment. Then he asked Aizen if he wanted to escape. Aizen replied that he didn't ask to be let out, but Shunsui pointed out that nobody who wants to stay would tell him to use the keys. Aizen fires back, saying that if Shunsui really wanted him to stay, he wouldn't have a key stuck in his chest. Realizing Aizen sees through his act, Shunsui stands up and reveals a scar on his chest. Turns out, he had to embed the key in his heart just to be here and partially unlock Aizen. Aizen realizes that if Shunsui dies, the gate to Mukin will be sealed forever, and Central 46 probably thinks Shunsui might die for that key, which Aizen finds typical of them. Shunsui defends Central 46, saying they just want to protect Soul Society. He steps aside, showing a row of attendants and a transport chair, inviting Aizen to sit so they can take him to the surface. Shunsui assumes Aizen misses fresh air, but stares at him silently. Suddenly, one of the attendants rushes forward, scared of Aizen, insisting he needs to bind Aizen before he sits. But before Shunsui can stop him, the attendant's fingers disappear the moment he gets too close to Aizen, leaving him screaming and bleeding everywhere. You see, the bindings don't eliminate Aizen's Reiatsu. Instead, the restraints just focus his Reiatsu closer to his body. This makes anything organic that gets too close turn into vapor. Turning to Shunsui, Aizen questions whether he will fight for Soul Society. Shunsui replies that they share similar interests. Aizen chuckles, looking down and wondering if Shunsui really wants him to breathe the air of a Soul Society that's about to be crushed by Yuhabaha. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the next episodes and subscribe for more videos.